Okay, so Wynn asked me to talk about, um, what is the title of my talk? I changed it. Oh, shit. Is this a disease, self-diagnosing something, something? <clears throat> anyway, so just a broad spectrum of uh, determining what a disease actually is. So it's really complicated for a lot of people. You can see scale insect, you can see Japanese beetle, but a lot of people don't really know what a disease is. Because a lot of times we see symptoms that are kind of confusing, even confusing to us sometimes. So I'm going to talk really broadly about diseases. I'm not going to talk about anything specific. Okay, so as a nursery grower, as a landscaper, as a, as, as a fruit grower, because fruit crops are one of my uh, assignments, you've got to know what to look for. We were, we were in the nursery last night and you know there were some questionable situations, but without knowing the history of a site, it's really hard sometimes for us to tell. So as the, as the nursery grower, as the business owner, you've got to become your own investigator. You, it begins with you because we can't work miracles. So my, my lesson today is basically going to be that you first determine whether your problem is actually a disease. And so that's what I want you to know today. And then if indeed it is, if you can't, if you don't know exactly what it is, then you send a sample. And what do you do with that sample? How do you send that sample? <clears throat> so disease diagnosis is like the game of clue. You're an investigator. You've got to figure it out by process of elimination. So that's basically what we do. You've got to determine where the damage is, what actually is doing that damage, and how it's happening. <clears throat> so let's start with the where. Where did the crime happen? On the leaf, on the stem, on the twig, on the roots, on the trunks, the entire plant. So you've got to make that determination. So that's where you're going to start. Leaves, for instance, you've got to get out, take a look. Is it the entire leaf? Is there a blight? Is there a collapse? The whole leaf died? Every leaf died? The upper sides of the leaves, are there spots on the upper sides or the lower sides? For instance, downy mildew, you're going to see the fungus on the lower side of the leaf. Whereas powdery mildew, you see the fungus on the top side of the leaf. Sometimes you see brown spots on the top of the leaf and yellowing on the bottom side of the leaf. So it really varies as you go and you've got to be able to tell me when you pick up that phone you got to be able to say all of the damage is on the top side of the leaf and there's nothing on the bottom side those types of things is it only the new leaves that are damaged so if it's just the new leaves and not the older leaves that kind of gives us an indication of when infection happened or if it actually is <clears throat> is an infection at all is the damage on the leaf margins we're going to see that today when we go out to the nursery damage on the leaf margins which indeed is not a plant disease so typically when you see a, a scorch or a margin burn unless it's some kind of vascular wilt it's typically not going to be a plant disease so those types of things just to be able to hold a conversation with me or with your agent and be able to say where the damage occurred on that leaf not just it's the leaves um, inner canopy, especially with your conifers, is the defoliation happening from the inside of the canopy and not on the outside, or in the lower canopy and not on the top? So you, you know most of these, black spot of rose. Uh, typically when you're looking at plant diseases, they're happening on the uh, inside that vein. Typically they're gonna follow the vein. Uh, sometimes you'll see scorching or collapse. That typically is not gonna be a plant disease. This one is, I think, powdery mildew, but typically that wouldn't be. This taxis, for instance, you seeing dieback from the bottom, and this is not a plant disease, actually that's a pH issue. Um, entire, this entire plant here collapsing, that's a root issue. So if there's no uptake to the entire plant, it's gonna be probably a root issue of some sort. Overall decline, a lot of times that's some kind of uptake issue, whether it's a damaged root system or um, some kind of canker or crown rot, some type of mechanical damage like mower damage uh, that can eventually lead to some type of rotting, a secondary uh, trunk rot. 
twigs and branches, that's another big one, um, to determine whether damage is just on the leaf or are you gonna follow it back? Are you gonna trace it back and say, yes, that damage, I have burned leaves, but there's damage on the branches or there's damage on the twigs or damage only on branches less than six inches in diameter. So all of those are components to the investigative process. Is it young twigs? Is it the lower branches? Is it the upper branches? <clears throat> The upper canopy, um, we're gonna see some of this. A lot of times this would be an indication of sun scald or some, something like that. Sometimes insect damage will do that. Uh, we see in galling, sometimes it's from guide wires, that type of thing. This is what we call a trunk canker or a, um, or a canker where the blackening is usually pretty soft. And usually if you pop that bark out, you're gonna see rotting tissue underneath. So those types of things to determine what type of trunk damage, branch damage. Uh, any greenhouse growers in here? No, okay, um, and, and a lot of times you're more herbaceous plants. They're gonna more collapse than cause a, um, a solid canker at the soil line, determining what's happening at the soil line. Uh, digging back, getting on your hands and knees, pulling back grass. A lot of times if there's grass, you're not seeing what's happening at the soil line. Um, it could be mole, a vole or a rat damage. It could be a, root, a, a rotting type, uh, root rot, crown rot pathogen. Um, Upper trunk, how high is it happening? A lot of your water molds, your phytophthora root rots, they're not gonna occur much more than a couple of feet off the ground if they're not at the soil line at all. Whereas if they're higher, that helps us make a determination of exactly what it could be, process of elimination. <clears throat> is the rot watery and mushy? A lot of times that's an indication of a, a water mold, phytophthora or pythium type root rot versus a dry rot, which could be um, black root rot or some, something like that. Um, a lot of times you'll see bark splitting, bark cracking. That's another word you've got to be able to say and you've got to be able to see it. When you pick up that phone, be able to say, oh yeah, by the way, there's cracking on the southwest side or they're splitting it, you know, across the entire trunk. Cankers, that's a really important one. A canker is basically a limb or a stem lesion. So on your greener, on your greener limbs, your canker is gonna look a little bit different than that black trunk I showed you a few slides ago. So to be able to say those things. So again, the investigative process, trace it back. What do you see? Exactly what do you see? And what's happening there? Uh, these pine seedlings, this is a Phytophthora root rot, and you'll see healthy, roots and as infection gets worse you see fewer white roots so that's something else to be able to dig those plants up and examine that root because usually if you see decline or a complete collapse of a complete plant you're going to start tracing back and if you're not seeing any kind of cankers on the trunks or stems you're going to dig that plant up don't pull the plant dig the plant shake it out what kind of root system do you have do you have a sufficient root system because we can't help you by looking at the top of this plant if the if the pathogen is not at the top of the plant, we can't diagnose it without the entire plant. So you've got to get it started. You've got to show us, tell us what you've got. A couple of more root pictures. This is a Phytophthora root rod in a container. You do much contain. You don't do much container growing. You do have containers. Where I'm from, everything is containers. But um, your root rot pathogens are basically your roots are going to be black. Uh, black root rot. They're also black. But your um, Phytophthoras and your water molds are going to be mushy and stinky. You're going to smell them. They're going to be wet. Um, so if you're having a problem, if you're having collapse, pop that, uh, contain, pop that plant out of the container, take a look at it. Any, uh, you no know, greenhouse growers here, but even in the landscape, digging up herbaceous plants and see what's happening. Is that root system reduced? Okay, next, next section. How does infection happen? Is it through wounds? Microclimates, we'll see those types of things today. Is it vectored by some insect, like viruses for instance? They're vectored by different types of insects? Or is there just a really high inoculum load? I was in a vineyard yesterday that had, um, had an anthracnose problem last year. They didn't do anything about it. So this year, even though conditions weren't conducive for disease, there was just so much of that fungus that overwintered in that vineyard. And so infection came again. And that can really happen. It can happen in the nursery. It can happen in 
the landscape, it can happen anywhere. So let's talk a second about wounds. You've seen some of these pictures already, but if you wound a plant, you're opening a door for some of these pathogens, secondary pathogens even. You wound it, you're going to probably get some kind of pathogen entered. Mower damage, weed eater damage. You see it in the bald and burlap nursery too. You open it up, you've got a lot of wood rotters that can go in there that normally would not. So just like JC was saying earlier about keeping your plants healthy, it's the same concept. This is, a Phytophthora, this is a Phytophthora canker that was chiseled back. So again, that was probably some kind of damage. Whether it was damage in the nursery, damage to the liner, maybe years before, and then that pathogen finally had conditions or the tree weakened, and it was able to just to, to explode. Um, guide wires, a lot of times those types of things, ties, when you stake a plant and you tie it, a lot of times any of those wounds are gonna open the door for damage. Insect damage, same thing. Uh, bad pruning cuts, whether it's a bad pruning cut or a good pruning cut to a tree that is not healthy enough to heal itself, a lot of times pathogen can enter. Um, different types of canker, some cankers are sunken and really exaggerated, sometimes they're a little harder to see. But a bad wound, sometimes a canker, what happens is the rot is happening deep into the tree. And as those branches are girdling out, nutrients and water cannot be uptaken into that plant. So as it gets hotter and drier during the summer, everything above that wound is gonna collapse. So we call that blight. So if one morning you wake up and an entire branch has collapsed, if you trace it back, you can probably find this. A lot of times you don't even have to cut it back. You'll probably see a canker like this, maybe not as exaggerated, but you can find that. And you can bet that uptake has stopped. <coughs> Inoculum load. Inoculum may be a new word for you, but that's simply how much of the fungus or how much of the bacterium or how much of the virus is there. So the more, the more fungal spores that are there, the more bacterial cells that are there, the better your chance for infection. So that makes perfectly good sense. This is an iris, and this is, this is a series of pictures by one of our diagnosticians, but he uses these spots on this iris leaf, and he zooms in, so there's a series of about 20 pictures that are really fascinating. But this just shows you that in one of those spots, there can be thousands of chains of spores. So in one spot, by letting disease explode, you're, you have a repeating spore stage, is what we call this, and each one of those spores can cause another lesion that in turn, sometimes in a week or two, can cause thousands of more infections. So the more fungal spores that are there, the more bacterial uh, cells that are there, the higher your chance for infection, whether you have wounding or whether they're just there on the leaf and, and they're ready to infect. So uh, sanitation, keeping, keeping diseased leaves out of the nursery, cutting those cankers out, <coughs> not letting those uh, pathogens produce spores or produce new bacterial cells. You're really reducing your chance for new infections. Uh, this nursery, this is an example of something I see a lot where uh, foliar leaf spots, those types of things, leaves fall to the ground. They're not cleaned up. And I know it's hard, but not cleaning them up. Those, those fungi are overwintering in those dead leaves. And next spring, when it starts warming up and the, it starts raining, all of those leaves, all of those spots are going to start producing new spores and blow and splash right back up into those healthy canopies. Cankers are a little bit different in the spring. Those cankers are gonna produce a lot of these fruiting structures. They're, they, you can usually see those. They look like black pepper flakes and they will open up and they are also full of spores. So removing sanitation, removing sources of inoculum is gonna reduce your risk. Vectors, uh, especially in cases of viruses, um, a lot of insects will vector different viruses. Usually they're fairly host specific. White flies, thrips, aphids, mites, a lot of vectoring. So if you have insect problems, don't think that they can't carry a virus if you do have any, any type of uh, viral issues. Some of your borers and beetles will also transmit diseases. Um, chestnut blight is vectored by a beetle. Thousand cankers disease, again, vectored by a beetle. So don't think these pathogens can't move by anything besides wind. 
microclimates. This is a really important one. Microclimate is simply, like we'll see today, if you have one small area with a specific, um, specific conditions, whether it's really humid on the inner canopy of a tree or whether it's the lower spot on a nursery where, where the hill goes down and your fog settles in the mornings. Any of those microclimates are possible. So you can still see um, downy mildew, for instance, in really low areas at this time of year, even though it hasn't rained in forever. <clears throat> um, irrigation, overhead irrigation, wetting leaves. Again, the wetter the leaves, the more, the more sporulation, especially by fungi, and wash down of bacterial cells, and that's going to really spread. Poor air circulation, that's another thing. The closer your plants are together, the less air circulation, the slower your plants are going to dry, and those humid conditions, those really wet conditions or humid conditions are going to um, be perfect breeding spots for, fungal, for fungi and bacteria, especially fungi. Um, nurseries, really, you know, once you get into trees, you plant them as the trees grow, canopies grow. It becomes more humid in there, especially in those inner canopies. Uh, greenhouses, notorious for, for issues that, that are sometimes uncontrollable. But anything with close spacing, anything that holds humidity, especially overhead irrigation. Uh, so pruning, thinning, letting air circulate. Okay, so how do you know what is actually causing the problem? So if, you've, if you know what's happening, if you know where it's happening and what the symptoms are, you then need to decide, is this a fungus, is this a virus, is it a bacterium, or is it no pathogen at all? <clears throat> so fungi, leaf spots, those are usually pretty easy. Usually a pathogen, a, a fungal pathogen is going to cause a pretty round spot, if not kind of blotchy, but a pretty round spot, and usually that spot is going to jump across leaf veins, so it knows no boundaries. Uh, sometimes we get rust that are raised, pu uh, the pustules will be raised, you can look at them from an angle and you can see the, ra uh, the raised lesions. These are pycnidia, a lot of your cankers or your uh, conifer diseases, they're going to cause larger fruiting bodies, you'll be able to see them a little more easily. Sometimes they're orangish yellow or salmon colored. Um, on conifers, typically they're gonna be like the size of pepper flakes. They're gonna be black on the undersides of the leaves or the needles. There are some fungi that cause vascular wilts. So they will colonize the vascular system of uh, plants and cause a collapse. Um, most of the time it's not a fungal wilt, but there are some. Greenhouses, again, you're going to see things like botrytis or gray mold, and it's going to collapse a lot of things. So sometimes you can actually see the fungus. Bacteria are a little bit different. Typically, your bacterial leaf spots are going to be angular, and they're going to be limited by veins. So they're going to, so if you see this hydrangea up here, you see those spots are not round. They don't jump across the veins. They're limited by those leaf veins. There are some, there are some uh, bacterial wilts that are going to cause wedge-shaped leaf lesions, and rarely we see a vascular uh, bacterial infection. This is bacterial leaf scorch, which is already active in Tennessee, I read yesterday, but um, bacterial leaf scorch is a vascular, vascular clogging type symptom. So what happens is when it gets hot and dry, there is no water uptake again, so you start seeing scorching. So this would typically be something we call an abiotic or a non-pathogenic uh, symptom, but in the case of bacterial leaf scorch, it is indeed a um, a bacterial pathogen. Bacteria typically when they do colonize the a vascular system we'll see what we call bacterial streaming. For those with herbaceous plants, anybody in the landscape business, if you cut it and you dunk it into water you'll see the bacterial cells. You can see they're kind of milky, they, they flow kind of in you know, a milky looking um, uh, gelatinous type material. So bacterial cells occur by the thousands, uh, even a lot more than fungal uh, pathogens. 
And our, our last um, major group is what we call water molds. That's where you're going to get into your Phytophthora, Pythium, Downy mildews. Water molds are not true fungi, and water molds require a constant film of water to complete their life cycle. That's going to be the overwatering symptom, where you're overwatering or you have bad drainage or it rained a lot. A lot of times you're going to see those water molds. When it dries out, you're not going to see Phytophthora. Typically, that would be a really wet season disease. Um, you see it a lot in containers, but also you can see it in your nursery. Water molds, let me say too, are not true fungi, so they are not controlled with true fungicides. You're going to usually use something like uh, Profite or Aliette or those types of uh, those types of products to control your water molds. So a uh, typical fungicide is not going to be effective. Here are a few more water mold pictures. I mentioned Phytophthora earlier. If it's occurring in the container nursery, if your irrigation is going and you have a really rainy period, you're probably going to see some Phytophthora. It's usually pretty common. So even though it can be introduced, you're typically always going to have Phytophthora. And when conditions are conducive for disease, then it explodes. But watery, mushy, stinky roots is your number one indication that it is a water mold root rot and not a fungal root rot. You can smell it. There's no doubt what's going on. <clears throat> some, of your, some of your root rots are going to cause reduced root systems. They can cause uh, rots at the soil line because they're a soil-borne uh, pathogen. And there won't be any feeder roots. So what happens is as your root system is reduced, then as it gets hotter and drier, again, there won't be enough roots to take up the water and nutrients that the plant needs. So if you had a Phytophthora root rot that didn't completely kill the plant in the spring, it may not be until July or August that you actually see the plant collapse when its root system just cannot support that upper canopy. Viruses, not something really common with the exception of rose rosette disease. That's something we're all seeing over and over again. Viruses typically are systemic. So once a plant is infected, the entire plant is infected, even though one branch is showing symptoms. We're having problems with a lot of growers who are propagating their uh, virus infected plants. They're cutting off the disease, the symptomatic branches, and then they're continuing to propagate these, these plants and they're spreading. They're actually growing virus ridden plants and then selling them out. So that's something pretty common. Uh, viruses, our typical virus symptoms are mottled leaves, with the exception of rose, not the exception, but rose rosette is a major exception for you, where you'll see what we call witch's broom, where there's just really clustered growth, uh, sometimes really long internodes, excessive thorniness. The, uh, sometimes the thorns never actually develop. They'll be really soft and they'll remain soft and small. Some leaf viruses cause strappy leaves that look just like herbicide damage. So that's another thing. Um, a lot of virus symptoms look like herbicide damage. <clears throat> so if you would suspect, for instance, virus symptoms, you've got to go back and determine, hey, did I really spray herbicides within the last two weeks? Did my employees spray herbicides in the last two weeks? Just because you didn't. But that's, that's pretty common, you know, that, that you swear it's a virus symptom and these leaves come into the diagnostic lab. And it, we can't detect a virus, or the diagnosticians can't detect a virus and suspect herbicide. And a lot of people say, I did not spray herbicide. You know, so it can be, it can be really touchy and sometimes we can't tell but you've got to be able to tell us you've got to be able to backtrack what did you spray did you spray 2,4-D on the next property over or on a, a drive row over and it volatized and moved over so you've got to be able to track that back and that's why I'm telling you that you've got to be the investigator that no one can solve your problems if you can't help us if you can't help us help you a few more virus symptoms. Typically, virus symptoms in herbaceous plants, you're going to see vein clearing. So chlorosis, typically, you're going to see green veins and yellow leaf tissue. Viruses are just the opposite. A lot of times, the veins will be yellow, and the rest of the leaf tissue will be green. 
There are good viruses. Tulip breaking, flower breaking, that's actually a virus symptom. A lot of your variegated, I don't know if you have like the um, Asian jasmine ground cover, that type thing here, those, those uh, variegated, those are virus, those are good viruses. All they do is change color. So there are a lot of viruses out there. But this is a really good one. It's an expensive one in a good way. Okay, so then there is the big question. What if it's an abiotic, dis abiotic disease, abiotic stresses? A lot of times we see nutritional issues, water-related issues, uh, sometimes planting the wrong, pla wrong plant in the wrong place, mechanical damage, um, orientation. Those types of things can really look like diseases. Those can look like disease symptoms. And that's something that you've got to be able to evaluate. You've got to be able to tell us or ask yourself what else is happening there. Nutritional issues a lot of times look like diseases. This taxis, I showed this taxis earlier. This is a pH issue. So the pH is very low in this site. So you see dieback, it looks like a root problem, but it's nutritional. Um, a lot of times nutritional issues, chlorosis, that type thing, <clears throat> extreme nutritional deficiencies, a lot of times those look like virus symptoms. So you've got to be able to track back, you've got to investigate what's happening in your nursery. <clears throat> scorch, this is a really big one and uh, we'll see some examples today. Typically scorch symptoms are going to be lack of water, something that is obstructing water uptake. Is it a newly planted tree? Is it a newly planted crop of plants that don't have the root system to sustain that canopy? <clears throat> scorch symptoms are typically going to be browning on the edges. A lot of times it's going to be really bright golden brown, not that black rotty type brown. So it, a lot of times it'll be really sudden and to be able to think back, what did my irrigation do? Is this a new plant? So again, the amount of root system, whether it can support it or not. And especially on new plants, you're not gonna see that wilting first. You're actually gonna see this scorching of leaf margins. So a lot of times, if they're scorching on the leaf margins, nine times out of 10, it is not a disease. <clears throat> Uh, wet feet, a lot of times if it's really wet, if you don't have a Phytophthora infestation, if you're not getting a, an actual root rot pathogen, you can still have rotting roots due to the lack of uh, oxygen to those roots, the roots are suffocating. And with those, with those damaged roots, a few months later, as it gets hotter and drier, you can see wilting and you can see collapse. Uh, sometimes even really wet soil, as those roots begin to go down, everything looks wilted and a lot of people go in and they keep watering instead of stop watering because the plant appears wilted. Wilt only means that there's not sufficient water going up to that canopy. It does not mean there's not sufficient water on the ground. It means that root is not carrying enough to the top of that plant. <clears throat> Geography and orientation, I kind of lump these together. It's basically the right plant in the right place. Putting shade plants in the sun, you're gonna pay for that. Um, Sun scald, a lot of young trees, a lot of times you'll see sun scald. A lot of, it's usually called Southwest disease in the, um, in the fruit industry. So a lot of times when you've got um, uh, a young tender trunk facing the Southwest side, when the really hot sun bakes in, a lot of times you'll see sun scald, which is very similar to frost cracks or freeze damage, which uh, freeze damage occurs when that plant is breaking dormancy and is actively <coughs> flowing through um, sap is actively flowing through that plant and then a freeze event occurs and that frozen um, that frozen liquid is going to crack that plant so freeze damage occurs in springtime after that plant begins breaking dormancy and then a freeze event occurs so frost cracks don't occur in January they typically occur well I guess here it's April um, wet feet, again, low areas in the nursery. If you're planting drought tolerant plants, which will be water sensitive, in a low part of the nursery, a lot of times you're just gonna have an unthrifty plant or you're gonna have that root loss and you're gonna have that wilting and collapse. <clears throat> this is sunburn, so a lot of times you have shade plants in the sun. This is camellia, you don't have many camellia here. Yeah, you have camellia here? Okay, so uh, camellia in the sun, when you get a really hot event, 
the upper leaves, anything that's facing up. So the upper part of the canopy is going to be exposed to more sun than the lower parts. So that's how you're going to diagnose whether it may be sunburn. It's what's facing up, what is getting the most sun. And sometimes you'll see it a little bit differently. Sometimes it'll be more yellow. But typically it's going to be either bronzing or a really quick whitening of the leaves or bleaching. Uh, this is frost damage. Let me go back. Th these two are frost damage, and you'll see if there is a frost event and you see the new foliage, new foliage will be more uh, susceptible to frost damage. So again, this really looks like a root rotting disease. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> the taxis at the top, they're really sensitive to frost damage. So a lot of times you'll see that and you've got to go back and you've got to be able to determine what were the weather events at that time or two weeks before, not the day before. What happened within the last two weeks? Was there a freeze event? Was there an extremely hot event? Did I move a tree and suddenly all of these plants went from being shaded to, in full, to being in full sun within a day or two? A lot of times that's when you'll see some of your uh, sunburns and sun scalds. Mechanical damage, a lot of t these types of things are going to lead to disease-like symptoms. So you've got to be able to evaluate, you've got to be able to trace back what happened, how it happened. Bad pruning cuts can uh, split bark and then again, anything above that bad cut or above that damage can collapse. You can see blighting, which is a really quick wilting and, and death of leaves. When you've got an entire branch or an entire section of a tree, go back and determine whether there is mechanical damage. Weed eater damage, again, bad pruning. All of those things will either lead to branch collapse or branch death or even stunning in the end. <clears throat> Insect damage, JC was talking about honeydew. You cannot imagine how much sooty mold we get. People thinking it's a disease, not realizing that aphids just eat more than their bodies can handle. And uh, honeydew feeds on those excess sugars that are excreted. Um, galls on oak, galls come in, everybody. I got an email the other day that said they had seed, the guy had seeds growing on his leaves. So popcorn growth, that was another one, with, I mean, just within the last month. So um, knowing, your insect, knowing your insects and to be able to trace back what's happening. Have you flipped those leaves over? Have you looked for insects? Have you looked for thrips? I think we're going to see some thrips today. Um, not major issues, but just to show you how to look for thrips. The entomologist will take care of that. <clears throat> So, you know, to determine what's actually happening and not exactly the symptom, to trace it back, be your own investigator. So in the end, <clears throat> you put everything I told you together. In the end, you know whether it is or is not an abiotic issue, whether it's probably viral or it's probably mechanical damage, then what do you do with it? That's when you get on your hands and knees. That's when you trace it back and you put together everything you've learned. Is it a fungal leaf spot or is it sun scald? <clears throat> is the wilt from a drought or is the wilt from a root rotting disease? Uh, those types of things. Is the witch's room caused by a virus or herbicide? Did you spray herbicide? Is there a shade plant in the sun or is there really a problem? So all of those types of things, that's why you are the investigator. That is why you have got to be the front line to the diagnostic process because a few dead leaves are not gonna help us help you. So the first thing I do, JC talked about a hand lens. Some people really can't see through a hand lens. They are very hard, I admit it. So a magnifying glass, everybody should have one in his glove compartment. Um, also there are the, um, the sheets, the magnifying sheets. There's even some that are small like credit cards and they can fit right in your wallet. You've got to have something to magnify some of these insects, some of these um, leaf spots and some of the sporulation. Is there, are there fruiting bodies in those cankers? All of those types of things. You've got to be able to get out some type of magnif uh, magnification apparatus and you've got to be able to look. <clears throat> I keep saying tracing back leaf blight. If you've got a blight, trace it back. Don't send a blighted twig to the diagnostic lab. Trace it back. Find a canker. Cut it below the canker. Send that canker in. So there's something causing it. And to trace it back is very important. 
Get on your hands and knees and crawl around. Crawl around the base of those plants, especially shrubs. See what's down there. See what's causing it. Um, we were talking last night about rat damage and um, rats, mice, uh, damaged by mice. And so if there's something eating the base of the plant, you have got to tell us that. That's something that we don't know and we can't tell. So be on your hands and knees. If you're not dirty, you're not a good investigator. Um, dig your plants up, please don't pull them. Dig it up, see what that root system looks like. See if the white feeder roots are there. If it's containers, dump that container. See this guy's smiling, we're never smiling when we have to dump containers, but dump it out. See what the root system looks like. See what's going on in there. <clears throat> so in the end, you still don't know what it is. You're close, you're pretty sure it's a disease then what do you do with it? And that's another million dollar question because it seems that submission of plant tissue, put it in a box, send it to the diagnostic lab, it would seem pretty easy, right? Apparently not. So what do I want from you? I want a disease. Please don't send mouse damage. Please don't send a dead branch that's not even showing a canker. Please, sh please send me something that we can diagnose. Um, insects, don't send, don't send sooty mold with a ton of aphids on the back. I actually got an email, I told you last week, of a um, river birch, two leaves, it was a really blurry picture, and she said, I'm pretty sure, I've narrowed it down to insects, and you could see it was on a black or dark piece of paper, and you could see the aphids on the, on the paper, and you know, just not knowing, you know, these leaves are turning black, I think it's, a, I think it's an insect. Well, you know what? If you haven't flipped that leaf over, we don't want your package. So I don't want to be, <laughs> I don't want to be mean, but, but seriously, you would not believe what comes in, what kind of pictures come into my email box and what goes into the diagnostic lab. <clears throat> Send whole plants when possible. Uh, Dwayne was saying last night that a lot of times he brings whole trees and there are 20 foot trees on the sidewalk in front of the diagnostic lab. That's okay. Um, small plants, we definitely always want the root system. Anytime you insist, expect it may be a root system issue it may be a collar rot anything like that send whole plants leaves only if there's a leaf spot I, we'd still appreciate branches again roots if at all possible absolutely dug roots not pulled don't send this send dead dying and healthy tissue all three so why am I so adamant about this? Because two thirds of the samples that arrive at the diagnostic lab are not diagnosed with disease. They're either insufficient samples or it's some kind of um, abiotic stress, it's some type of cultural issue, sometimes it's chemical injury, sometimes it's insects, but two thirds of the plants that actually come into the diagnostic lab come back as no diagnosis. And then you're very upset because you know you've got a problem and you need help. So that's, that's my point today, is to be your own investigator, determine what you think is going on, and at least send us a sufficient sample so that we can help you determine exactly what the problem is. So only 30% of the samples that came in 2010 to the diagnostic lab were actually pathogenic. I know, my mouth dropped too, and so I started going back to all the others. So I just got here, so I started going back to all the reports, and year after year, only a third are actually pathogenic. If you wanna know, your agent is always gonna help you submit a sample, but you can just Google um, Kentucky Plant Pathology or University of Kentucky Plant Pathology. When you get to the website, um, there are description forms that'll help, you, that'll help you tell us what's happening. There are two different forms. <coughs> Uh, they'll tell you how to submit the sample. They'll ask you to put it in a plastic bag so that if there is a fungal pathogen, it can be producing spores and not shriveling up so they can look at the spores. Um, I've said all of this already, dead is too late. There's nothing here but saprophytic type fungi that are feeding on dead wood. Dig, don't pull, submit the entire plant when possible. Branches should be at least 12 inches long. If they're too big to put in the box, cut them in pieces, that's okay. This is the website for our diagnostic lab, or for our um, plant pathology. You don't have to be able to read this, but basically across the top and down the side, it'll say extension, and you can just go down there and um, 
Under extension, you can click plant, di plant disease diagnostic lab, and you can find anything you need to know. You can find the forms, you can find the instructions. Again, that's what your agent is here to help you. But if you can get those forms early and you can start thinking about what you're supposed to be submitting, and then that'll help the agent, that'll help your agent help you, and then submit it if so it is required, if they don't see something that you've missed. <clears throat> Let me also say that if you go to this website, there's a tab in there that says publications. You can find any publication for any type of plant. They're um, subcategorized, so woody plants, herbaceous plants, that type of thing. So you can always find publications there. Uh, so form number one is all about you. Tell us about what's going on. There's not a blank for your email address. If you do put your email address, you receive what's called a speedy reply. That's an email of what you're going to get on paper. If you don't put your, e if you don't put your email address, the your agent is going to receive the two copies. It's a three-part form, but your agent is going to receive the copies, and your agent is going to mail you your written copy of what's going on. So if you put your email address, you and your agent receive the speedy reply and you'll at least see what's going on <clears throat> and form number two this is the yellow copy this is a two a two part form front and back and there's a lot of information there they're asking for a lot of information when was the last time you fertilized how much did you fertilize have you sprayed herbicides all of those questions all of those things I've presented to you today they're gonna be on that form and the more you can fill out the more you can help us help you <clears throat> so now I've thrown a lot of information at you. You don't have any disease specifics today, but hopefully you can at least get out there and kind of evaluate what you've got, what your situation is, and what to do with it. And so that if you do choose to send an email to your agent instead of bringing in a plant, you've at least kind of thought it out and at least photographed the trunk or photographed a canker or photographed something that may be the causal agent of your problem. So I'm gonna leave this up. Um, I do run a Facebook that I'll have pictures of whatever's going on. I took pictures of powdery mildew on oak last night and I posted it on there. A lot of times I will post um, links to fungicide, uh, fungicide evaluations or I'll post um, you know, what to do with it, cultural, cultural type issues. I mix ornamentals and fruit crops because those are my assignments. <clears throat> the web address is too long so you can just, in the search box for Facebook, just type in UK diseases of whatever and if you hit diseases in UK it'll pretty much pop up uh, they all forward to Twitter I personally don't like Twitter but all my Facebook um, um, posts go to Twitter and I do run a blog and that's going to be really specific but that'll also go to Facebook so they're all linked together in this horrible over over informative kind of way but that's gonna that's gonna tell you a little bit more detail on how to control something and actually list a lot of fungicides so if you see something really detailed on my Facebook it just links back so I'll leave that up there and um, anyone is welcome to email me if you do email me I will reply to you and copy your agent so it, you, you should work through your agents but if anybody has any questions we all try to work together to help you. And I do not object to you sending bad pictures sometimes if you really don't know. I would just expect you to think about it so that you can have a better chance of getting a diagnosis and helping your situation so that you don't lose money. This video has been part of the University of Kentucky Nursery Crops web series. For more information on the topics discussed, please contact your county extension office.